there's a lot of things to do and some really good items in Act 3. One requires you to find parts to craft it, another you need to detect and dig it up. Some of the quests you're able to take a quicker approach to complete them. Certain merchants and quests have some really nice unique items that don't just look good but have other beneficial qualities. In this video, I'll be covering 20 things to do in a somewhat specific order. I updated the map for all the locations of interest. You can just swap this out however you like, depending on your preference. I also have a full guide for just about every one of these locations that I'll link in the description below if you want to check those out. Hands down, one of the number one spots to visit is the House of Hope, as it contains some of the best items and armor in the game. It's got pretty much a little something for everyone in there. In this room to the right here, that's right across the room from the succubus, there's a hidden room there that you have to pass with a dice roll to access it. Within there is the Hell Dust Comet, which looks really nice. Gives you some dark vision, blind immunity, critical hit immunity, plus two bonus to saving throws against spells, and comes with a unique spell, Immolating Gaze, which does some fire damage and has the potential to cause fear in your opponents. It also has a really good staff and they are called the Staff of Spell Power and that has a special ability called Arcane Battery which provides you with a free spell casting of your choice. If you save the Tieflings at Emor Grove then Mole's Contract with Raphael will be in here as well. If you take out the Succubus you'll get the Helldust Gloves which are really good for monks as it provides a extra 1-6 to six necrotic damage and possibly inflicts bleeding. For anyone else, they'll do an extra 1 to 6 fire damage, which also comes with the unique spell Rays of Fire. Another room contains the Amulet of Greater Health, and that'll set the wearer's constitution to 23. Really nice to make anyone extra durable, as it'll add an extra 50 hit points to them. This room also contains the legendary hammer, the Orphic Hammer, which you need in order to break out Orpheus, as well as Hope which will lead you to another legendary weapon, the Silver Sword, if you haven't killed Voss yet, that is. <laughs> also in the room are another really nice set of gloves, the Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength, and that will set the wearer's strength to 23. You should definitely save Hope when you come here. She will provide you with a lot of healing for that final battle, and reward you with the best unarmed gloves in the game. Then for the final battle, you can use the non-fatal knockout ability on Hope's sister, Corilla. Hope will thank you for not killing her sister, and for those that don't know, if you got abducted by Priestess Gut at the Goblin Camp and didn't pass the dice rolls to break yourself free, then Kirilla comes to your rescue and takes her out. Kind of ugly you always was. Disappointing not to have my own squiddy, but your giblets will make for a tasty supper. I may have left that a little late. No lasting damage, I hope. For winning the final battle and breaking hope free, you get the Gloves of Soul Catching. They provide an extra 1 to 10 force damage for unarmed attacks, providing a extra 10 points per turn, or you can pass that up and just get an advantage on your attack rolls. To top it all off, it gives you a plus 2 to your constitution, giving you a few extra hit points. You also get the Hell Dusk Armor, which is definitely the best armor in the game having a armor class of 21, being proficient with it regardless of who's wearing it. When you have saving throws, the caster receives burning for three turns, resistance to fire damage, and can't be burned, and comes with one of the best abilities, Fly, which is really nice if you didn't want to take on the Astral Tadpole. Number two on the list is at the Elf Song Tavern. You can upgrade your camp here for free if you persuade the innkeeper. This is a really nice upgrade to your camp as it looks really nice, it will always be the same with easy to find companions and storage, as well as coming with one of my favorite songs in the game. Keep your voice down about the bloody murder upstairs. <clears throat> to 
top floor's all yours. If it gets a bit too noisy at night, well, don't sleep above a pub. Another one you want to head straight on over to is Sorcerer's Sundries. It contains a few hidden books there. One unlocks the final page for the Book of They. Others unlock some powerful spells like an angel summon that you can bind permanently to a wizard. Gail's quest is also tied to one of these books. The vendor sells some really good items here as well, such as the Vest of Soul Rejuvenation, a hat that will boost your charisma, and a regeneration ring. It also has a legendary staff here that has a special ability arcane battery, which can grant you an extra level 6 spell. That's the same ability that we just got off of the staff of spell power at the House of Hope. You can alternate these and stack them, so I definitely recommend getting the dual wheel perk if you have any spell casters, and you can alternate between the two, granting you an extra 2 level 6 spells. You also get the Robe of the Weave here, which will provide you some extra health regen if you have any saving throws for spells. For the Book of Thay's final page, you'll be able to summon four ghouls. They come with 20 hit points, attack on their own, and have poison immunity. They're pretty good for just soaking up some damage, and they do some decent damage as well. You definitely want to head on over to Kazador's place pretty soon if you use Astarian. There you can choose to either free the prisoners by letting them go, or you can choose to free the prisoners by consuming them. If you ascend Astarian, he'll get the gaseous form, the Ascended Knight, which does a lot more damage, and he does an extra 1-10 to 10 necrotic damage on all of his attacks, making him pretty overpowered. Addition out some pretty good damage with his sneak attacks coming in at 24 to 58 damage. That's how much my monk does just with his open hands though, so yeah, monks are pretty overpowered. You also get the Staff of Woe off of Casador. It's got the potential to heal you. It comes with the Blight spell and its bound weapon, meaning it can't be knocked out of your hands and it instantly comes back to you if it's thrown at someone. Prior to meeting Casador right after descending the elevator, you come across this bridge, if you open either of these doors to the right here, you can just fly down beneath. If you have a high enough perception, you can detect the buried treasure here. It contains a very rare rapier that does some radiant damage, and it's got a pretty nice animated glow to it. Castor's main castle, you'll find a room with a cursed Victoria blocking the path to a chest. In the chest is the Helmet of Grit that provides an extra additional bonus action if you have 50 hit points or less. But the real treasure here is Victoria as you can pick her up and take out just about anyone without any repercussions. This is definitely the easiest way to kill the hag. Unfortunately, you will kill Fenra along with her this way. So for number five, we have Laura and the hag. She 
to definitely stop here in the very start as soon as you enter in as the barracks are right at the top here and you need to talk to Laura in order to get the quest. On my first playthrough though, I didn't talk to Laura and I just stumbled across the hag and ended up taking her out and saving her child, but she didn't give me any reward for saving Fanra. After you talk to Laura in the barracks, you should head on down to the hag survivor hut. It's right beneath the beehive general goods store. There you'll find Marina if you saved her and she's been cursed. You have to kill the idol and then you want to open the safe on the first floor. Read both of the books and you want to craft the hag's bane. At this point you can just head on over to the blushing mermaid and toss the hag's bane on the captain here. Which is actually the hag in disguise. I didn't realize this until I just went in here messing around with Victoria trying to kill someone that was on the assassination list. Apparently if you didn't kill Ethel in Act 1 though, it will be the original captain. If you toss the hags being on Ethel here in the Blushing Mermaid, she'll just cough up Venra and retreat back into her lair. Then you can just go to Laura's house and claim the rewards. One is an amulet that grants gusts of the wind and gaseous form. The other is a pretty nice legendary rapier that's got a unique dual ability as well as granting you a bonus attack if your offhand is empty. And you'll score a critical hit at 19. Here, a token. If you did want to kill Auntie Ethel, you can save the captain by just avoiding attacking them. You can sneak behind all of them, but as soon as you fight Ethel, they'll join in on the fight, making it a little bit harder. The captain is the only one that keeps her mind among the survivors though. <laughs> back to Marina and you'll get an amulet that provides an advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. I look forward to finally being able to sleep with both eyes shut. <sighs> it's an orphanage, Octa. What would you have me do? Depending on how badly you want mix, we have our number six on the list. You'll find Sticky Dondo in the guild here that sells a pretty nice cape for thieves. Finding Minx is also tied to Jahira's quest, but you don't need her in order to find him. I've heard you don't even need her in order to recruit him. Some people have said that they were able to just choose a dialogue option that projects an image of her in your camp and then he just runs off to your camp. I know if you kill her though, that's definitely a different story. For the second part of the quest, you'll have to go to the vault. And I've unlocked every vault here to show you which is the best items. Vault number 9 definitely has a really nice armor piece in there. The keys are scattered all over Act 3. Some you won't be able to get into the later part of the game, like Lord Gortash's key. But you could just lockpick all of them, which could be kind of hard to do at a level 30 requirement. It didn't take more than maybe 3 or 4 tries though with an experienced lockpicker. Number 4 Vault has a pretty nice trident in there. That causes water surfaces on hits, which is really nice for the Wave Mother's Robe as that will heal you at the start of the turn if you're standing in water. Number 6 is Lord Gortash's Vault, and it contains a tadpole as well as some extra lore in there. The Number 1 Vault has the Nymph Cloak in there, which has the Dominate Person ability. This cape you could have gotten in Rivington at the start from the black market dealer that was selling to the refugees, but he vanished it soon after, so you might have missed out on this. Number 2 Vault has Lady Janice hat that provides an advantage on persuasion and deception checks. That's pretty much it for all the good items there. Then for the final part, you want to head into the sewers. You can access it behind the Nine Fingers Guild or just take him right at Ballast Gate Waypoint and accessing it through the manhole. You'll find Moonglow in there with Minx and the fake Jahira. 
Moonglow will try to run away as soon as you show up, but you can kill her right then and there and take 10k off of her. I tried to save and recruit Minx, but I killed Jahira. I mean, I had to. She came at me with 10 hit points. Congratulating you, of course. Faced with the saddest scene in the game. When you come back to the guild side out, you'll find the Centrum has invaded them. If you let Moonglow run away previously, then you'll find her here and she'll offer you a deal with them. If not, then they'll automatically attack you. Moonglow will still have the 10k gold here, so I suggest just taking her out. Then Nine Fingers will offer you some aid for the final battle. But don't feel bad if you feel like taking her out too. If you stop by this on Marked House, you'll find a murder scene. At first, I thought it was just part of the assassination list, but I saw one body that was decapitated, and then another, and then the kid was even taken out too with. No blood markings on the wall like normal assassinations here. Which just kind of had me wondering, what the hell? But if you walk up further here near the bed, and you have a high enough detection, you'll notice a hidden plank in the floor with a note from Nine Fingers. For number seven, we have the Facemaker Boutique. It's part of the assassination quest. I've mainly worn Lizelle's body harness the whole game which makes me look naked, without being naked. And they had a bottom only piece, which makes me look even more naked. Clothing just looks too bulky on the dragonborn, and dragons are, well, normally naked. Got yeah, just about every clothing piece here, like the succubus harness that's only found at the House of Hope, and a unique piece that's only found here, same exact outfit that the angel summon wears. Stop by the House of Grief for Shadow Hearts quest. Tell her. Tell them all. Tell them how the Night Singer has blessed me. blessing in those circumstances. He rewards you with a handmaiden's mace. Really nice, as it sets your strength to 18. As well as having the best shield in the game here. While being attacked, you can use the reaction to deal 2 to 8 force damage and knock him prone. It has a reflective shield ability to reflect any projectiles back at enemies. It also has the ability of warding bond. Gaining resistance to all forms of damage, plus one bonus to armor and saving throws, with the drawback of taking damage along with the bonded target. Still a really strong ability though. You also get Viconia's Priestess Robe here, giving you some advantage on stealth checks, and a plus two bonus to all saving throws. Completing the area will open up a romance scene with Shadowheart, regardless of the god that she's chosen. 
Only if your approval is high enough, though. That's what makes it so good. For number nine, we have Saving the Duke. You want to stop by the Water Queen's house first, though, and get their quest. It was so heroic. My word. I can't wait to tell Scorv what happened. Giving up the captain on your way back will reward you with the Wave Mother's robe. Besides looking really nice, it provides some resistance to fire and cold damage, and it heals you if you're standing in water at the start of your turn. It also lets you create or destroy water that will last forever. At first, I was wondering why Shadowheart just kept making that sound when she was standing in random puddles of water. You can swap out the outfit to other companions and just save on resting or using healing spells. Number 10 is Jahira's house if you have her. There's a neat little puzzle beneath her home with a few nice weapons and an amulet that prevents Jahira from being cursed. If you save the artist in Act 1, you'll find him at Lady Janus' house. It's not too rewarding of a quest, but he's linked to Mystic Carry On, which has some better rewards. Oh no. She has forgotten you entirely. Pretty neat, Mystic Carrion will tell you where to find the final page of the Book of Thay if you persuade his spirits. <laughs> if you kill him, he drops all of these pretty nice armor pieces, but you have to help out his servant in order to do that. For 12, we have the Githyanki Egg, or Omelium. If you met Amelium in the Underdark, and you didn't give the Githyanki egg to Lady Esther, then you'll find him here if you saved him along with the Duke. He'll only give you a handful of some crappy spells as a reward though. If you did give the egg, you'll find everyone here dead with a portal over here. Githyanki youth, and a familiar one at that. Can it be that this is the one who hatched from the egg you took from the crash? Yankee! Do not call me that. You stole me from my people. Gave me to that woman. You can choose to peacefully part ways with the Githyanki, or you can end up taking him out. He'll create a lot of illusions that have some pretty neat teleportation spells and attacks. You will drop a pretty strong amulet that you can prevent an attack of any kind if you're near an ally. You can only use that ability once per short rest, but it's still really strong, especially versus bosses. In order to take out Lord Gortash easily, you want to take out the Steel Watchers at the Steel Watch Foundry. But you should stop here at this little boat first, as it's got a pretty high stash of six tadpoles hidden here. You can use the invisibility spell to just sneak past the Watchers. And if you don't detect it, you can just walk up to the box and open it. For the Steel Watch Foundry, you should make sure to take out the Steel Watchers rather than just sneaking by or convincing them, because eventually they'll come apart where you have to break out some prisoners and they'll just make a break for it and probably end up dying to the Steel Watchers. You can craft a really nice crossbow here. In order to do so, you need this giant Watcher's arm that's sitting on the south end of this table here. Then you want to head through these giant security office doors. You'll find the crossbow blueprint sitting on the table here. If you head to the east side, you'll find a giant watcher's home that's got some pretty nice stats. 
On the outside of the giant security office doors we just lockpicked, you'll find the targeting module sitting on top of a table here. Once you grab that, head on into the security office again, and on the north side you'll find a crafting bench. You want to combine all three items, and you'll get the Hellfire Engine crossbow. It's got a pretty nice AoE lightning arrow, as well as the ability to pull targets closer to you. Taking out the boss here will also grant you the legendary bow. It comes with a nice ability that frightens and does some extra radiant damage after every attack. It also has the Celestial Haste ability, which is like the normal haste, but doesn't come with the exhaustion debuff with it. For number 14, we have Stop the Press. Then we can only hope the fist do their duty when they escort you to the gallows. Your days of scumming up this good city streets will be over. sneak by the guards or just kill them all. At the bottom you'll find the printing machine that's controlled by a fairy. If you save Dolly in Act 2 then he'll automatically help you. There's a few positive headlines that you can insert into him but they have a neutral one that's just sitting on the same floor over here that's the cutest cat you've ever seen. On my first playthrough I didn't change the press and I didn't notice any citizens that were treating me any differently, so I don't know if they've updated this or not. Oh, you have returned. How delightful. Right now, pal. Should be on the streets tomorrow. For 15, we have the graveyard dogs. You can access a few of the graves beneath, and they're all connected via a small passageway. The most interesting grave is the one that the owner's buried his pups with them. If you open one of the dog's graves, then the dog's spirits will appear and attack you, along with the owner's spirit. If you take out the owner's spirit, then all of the dog's spirits will go with him. Number 16, you should pay a visit to Damon the Blacksmith. If you have Karlak in your party, you probably want to stop here a little bit earlier. And he does sell some pretty good items. If you didn't murder everyone at the Tieflings camp. <laughs> For suspicious toys, which you'll pick up in Rivington, you can open all the doors and toss some grease or an extra explosive on the second floor. And take out most, if not everyone here with Scorching Ray. When 
underneath the hatch is a secret room if you pull the lever here. It's a perfect place to uh, stuck upon some explosives. Unless you... A trap. For the murder tribunal, they have a hidden merchant here if you join them. He sells some unique items that cater to rogues. If you take out the boss here, you'll get a really nice great sword that heals you on hits, as well as an amazing helm that gives you dark vision. Just as the number you need to roll a critical by one. Can't be frightened, and don't take any other emotional altering conditions. You'll find Siren in the middle of the sewers here. What's this, cousin? Another absolutist come to see what we did to poor old Siren. You'll find her skull right next to the entrance of Orin, behind the voiceless merchant. Picking up the skull will make her spirit appear and follow you. You want to head back to where Siren's coffin is at. Hope seems willing to speak. If you place the head on the body, she'll reward you with a magic amulet. Now let's use your reaction to make an attack roll or saving throw with an advantage. I saved Orin for last because as soon as you enter the sewer, she'll capture one of your companions, wanting you to take out Lord Cortez or she'll kill your companion. Unless you don't care about your companion, then you can do this earlier. You'll be rewarded with Orin's armor, which gives you a plus one attack to damage rolls while shapeshifting, as well as giving you an advantage to deception and persuasion checks. Looks pretty nice with the black and azure as it makes it all black. Look at the bloodthirst dagger as well. Reduces the number you need to roll crit by one. Also making enemies vulnerable to piercing damage on the main hand attack. The last item you get for taking out Orin is the Crimson Mischief. Gives an additional one to four piercing damage against targets with 50% of their hit points or less. For offhand, you can add your ability modifier to the damage of the attack. This one's better as a offhand in my opinion, and the bloodthirst is better as a main hand. And that pretty much covers up most things to do in Act 3. I'll add a few extra links in the description below for a few of the ones I did miss, like the location of a special potion and the location of Lord Gorchash's parents for an additional two tadpoles. Hope you enjoyed the video, take it easy, and I'll catch you on the next one.